Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. I'm here with some of my best friends from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. We've got to my far left, Kent Anderson, Lance Sellers, and the one and only Josh Fields. Uh, you guys, this is the last day, Sunday morning. Josh, you look maybe like you're tired. <laughs> I'm not sure. It, it's a lot of uh, a lot of talking, a lot of standing for three days straight. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel tired, but thank you for letting me know I look tired. Lance is pulling out the eye drops <laughs> and the, the bare aspirin right now. Right. It's, a, it's a problem. <laughs> it's, it's not our first rodeo. <laughs> It is, it is a lot of talking. So this is a forward hunt expo for all of you that uh, don't know. And we're actually podcasting from the Ruger Marlin booth. And last morning, you know, we've been here four days. This is coming out of, I don't know, is this your guys' last show for the year? Or where are you going uh, after no, this? No, it's the last big one for the year. We got a couple mm-hmm. local ones back in Montana that we're going to do. So yeah. we're going to head back up to the Northwest uh, for next week, a sportsman show, and then a couple others after that. So, so you're still going at it after yep, this. I'm so going. sorry. I'm on staycation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out after this. I don't, you know. Well, uh, you've been you've been in it hard for a long time. Well, you know? yeah, I mean, just January and then through. It's 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 a month and a half long hitch, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so, but you know, I was hunting clear up until um, mid January for deer this year. Mm-hmm. So my my archery season was just really rough, and I had some really hot weather in Missouri when I was there, and and it was just like 80 degrees and you're sitting in a tree stand like baking like why this is not the way the whitetail run is supposed to be looking at an eye hole with the snow coming down yeah yeah and then i go back in january and i'm getting blown out of the trees freezing and is complete opposite but and you know post rut is just so different hunting deer than pre-rut they're they act different those bucks are so spooky i mean any movement any sound um i had one buck one night that just sat um Lance is falling out of his chair. For those of you that don't know, he needs a walker. Oh, no. He's cramping out. That's a hammy cramp. Literally. He's literally cramping out. Oh, boy. Oh, no. No, we're going to keep rolling. I think think Lance, man down, man down. Somebody get this man some electrolytes. For those of you listening. For For those of you listening. Lance literally just went down, fell out of his oh, chair onto the hammy, ground with a cramp. Hammy cramps it was are the brutal. worst. Uh, we're gonna get him some electrolytes. We got some wilderness athlete. You know what you need? We need we need to get him a recovery, uh, a rescue drink, a, re- a rescue drink. Yeah, you need you need you need saved right now. Oh boy, he's he's making his way back over. Oh, you're it's okay. Good. This is wild and uncut. It's supposed to be real. Yes, <laughs> yes. That was real. That was real. He started talking about deer and cramps up. <laughs> Speaking of deer, Kent, Kent spent some time this year chasing deer and had a wonderful season. I yeah, did. I had really twice. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, ended up uh, South Dakota. The first week of September went out trying to kill a buck in velvet and got it done uh, day two in the stand. So way oh, go ahead and brag. Okay. Yeah, way yeah, pre-rag. Well, it's finally about a year. You're like, oh, yeah, I just took two days, Chris. How many weeks did you take? You know, I have worked really hard at finally kill some whitetails with my bow, and it came together this year. So ended up way early. Um, the tough part with the early season is they're very patternable, and they're pretty easy to find for the most part, figure out where they're at. And then it's a timing game. So early. Do you have any heart conditions, Lance, before you drink this? Let's just <laughs> stop really quick. 
because that does have some caffeine in it. I want to make sure that you're going to be okay drinking. This I, I just hope here. it doesn't run through my Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Is this real life? Yeah, Yogi <laughs> just threw Lance a wilderness athlete hero to get him over this cramp session, and I just want to make sure that his pacemaker can handle the caffeine load he's about to get. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this is a real thing now. He's oh, oh my no. gosh, what is going on this morning? <laughs> I think it went down the wrong pipe. Oh my God. Wow, oh. <laughs> I, got... <laughs> welcome to trade show season with Lance. Holy cows! Oh my gosh, <laughs> he's off and running this morning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh! I'm here. literally sweating right now. I'm laughing oh, yeah. so what? hard. <laughs> he, he spit on my uh, my recorder here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yogi's gonna do a white boy. You need to. You want to do that with a napkin, not your hand. Apologize. That's gonna be That's uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> it is I've, last day. It, yes. <laughs> oh, is this still real life? Yeah. All right. All right. We're walking. All right. It we're going to we're going to we're, we're going to rein it in now. Okay. Cramps uh, out. You cramps don't get to drink out. anything else. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh boy. All right, so we're good now. Sorry. Lance's cramps are over, and uh, Laugh attack. his heart has oh. stabilized, and now we're, we can move on. Um, Kent. Yeah. So <laughs> Back to your deer hunting I was story. At, yeah. uh, you know, the early season, the tough part is they get pretty, uh, you know, you can pattern them pretty easy, but you're playing that nocturnal game. So mm -hmm. when they're velvet, it's pretty spot on, same time every day, and then you just hope they show up in the daylight. Yeah. And this year... About 6.30 in the evening, um, had eight bucks pop up in front of me, and they basically started working down. They were either going to get my wind or come in front of me. Luckily, they chose a path in front of me, uh, shot that first buck at 20 yards. It was pretty awesome. We ended up having a picture of him at, like, 6.30 in the morning. He had just rubbed most of his uh, velvet off, so there's a bunch hanging off. So when he came in, I knew which one he was, and uh, so finished up there. Had a decent elk season, and then late fall, uh, mid-November went back for the whitetail rut and I've got a spot I've been hitting the last couple of years been really good and I had shot a cow elk a couple weeks prior with my son and I was kind of concentrating on trying to find a good mature old buck and uh, day two of that hunt uh, rattled and grunted a little bit and ended up looking to the south of me and buck comes out popped out and ended up working right in and um, was able to rattle and grunt him into 20 yards and made a great shot on both deer. Um, mm -hmm. So I spent a total days or total of four days in the stand for two deer this year. So mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a tough one to top. But um, whitetails kind of have me hooked here in the last couple. Oh, of years. Oh, they're so, so fun! It is. Yeah. It is a blast. Yeah. So yeah, no, a good season. I had some hard knocks on mine. Like you know, pre rut when a buck starts cruising by and they go behind a tree or a branch or brush, you like draw in anticipation of where they're going, and. I had a buck come in on, on some turnips and uh, he, I waited. I did that. He went behind a tree and I drew in anticipation of where he was going and he, he heard just the slightest noise. And that time of year, they're so spooky. He was like, Arr! put the brakes on. Put the brakes on and stared at me and I'm at full draw. And he just finally, after he stared at me for like a minute or whatever, um, turned and just walked off. And I mean, it, it was just completely different strategy because that post rut late season, you want these deer to be standing where you want to shoot them. Then you draw because they're going to lock in on you and stare. And that's when you make your shot. And, yep. and I hunted this deer like I would during the rut and it was a mistake and it cost me six days in the stand and I had to sit. Well, I actually had to go sit other places and wait for wind again. And I never did have a mature buck come in for five days and my last night in the stand we were able to we had the right wind to go back to that same stand and he came into the turnips and that time I was a little smarter and I waited for him to be where I needed him and uh, when I drew well it was 30 mile an hour winds blowing snow sideways <laughs> like it was nasty 
And when I drew, I'm in this big raincoat, and it's all because it's frozen, you know. And he locked in on me, and the wind gusted about the same time, and it blew my pin right off of him, oh. and I had to settle back in. And luckily, he stood there long enough for me to make a shot, but he just started to turn, and I got him. But it's so, it's so interesting how much these animals change. I mean, whether we're talking coyotes, turkeys, elk, deer, you know, the phase of the rut really affects how we hunt them, how, how we talk to them, whether we're calling or not calling or, you know, whatever we're doing. And, um, you know, right now it's predator season. And Lance, you and I were talking yesterday a little bit about predators and um, kind of going over some of your top tips or tactics or techniques. Let's just do like a little high level highlight here on a couple multi-species, you know, yeah. tips and tactics. I think that'd be fun for our listeners mm -hmm. on... Um, you know, because we have so many seasons coming up, it was the first of the year, and right now we're hot in bed with coyotes. So, Lance, what do you, um, what are some of your top tips for those? Uh, some tips that work for me, at least, is it's breeding season right now. So, distress like a dead rabbit, you might get one, two coyotes to come out of ten, just because they're concentrated on breeding. And I hunt all the cattle fields. It's calving season too, so they love the afterbirth or the calf crap. It has nutrients in it. You can't pull a coyote away from that mm -hmm. prime rib to come to a, a circle C hot dog or something. Yeah. And so we're doing spot and stock now. I use a bovine decoy from Montana decoys at night. And I hunt at night with thermals. I Which walk. you can do on a lot of private land, but not a lot. I mean, a lot of states like Wyoming, it's not legal on public at That's night. That's correct. So you've got to watch your state same regulations. Same as Oregon. Yeah. Uh, Idaho is pretty open on that. And just walk in. If you walk in with a decoy, though, don't go towards the cows. The cows spook. Yeah. The game's over. So I, I do a V while the coyote's feeding. I keep walking here outside of the cows. And right when then I get set, right when they go... Make sure there's not a house behind me or yeah, a farmer's dog coming to see out there chase and then pop a coyote. Then the rest of the coyotes run off. People ask me, well, how come you only shoot one? Well, I'm field hunting. I'm urban coyote hunting. Yeah. There's a difference from urban coyote hunting and sure. sagebrush counting hunting. Mm -hmm. and so what's uh, you were talking yesterday a little bit about barometric pressure, and I know this is something you've been tracking. We won't disclose how many years you've been journaling barometric pressure lands i can tell you 12. Uh, uh, it's been longer than that i believe because uh, i've known you for 12 years and you were doing it before that so that's true okay uh, so anyway we won't date either of ourselves but you've been tracking barometric pressure for, for a long time and what i find really interesting is even even in the infancy of my elk hunting career or lifestyle um You've always talked about hunting elk on a falling barometer, not a rising barometer, that and is then correct. being more vocal and more active. And well, you're seeing the same thing with coyotes. When I was <clears throat> 12, my grandfather said, uh, told me, explained to me what the pressure does to milking cows. Yeah. Our milk production was lower when it's 30 than it was when 29. And my grandfather was religious about it. He was a wise old, you know, coot. And so he always ingrained that in me, you know, when I was hunting, especially elk. What that means is if you're out there elk hunting, you go to blow your two sound, it seems like it goes five feet and drops. That's usually when the pressure's in the 30s. It's just heavy. 29s, you can bugle and it ricochets off the valleys and the mountains, and usually you get a response. It's When it's in the 30s, we don't have a very good call-in session for coyotes, elk, a lot of fishermen use it too. They're so the number's 30 mm -hmm. and under, or has it got to be 29, 29? 29. It seems like the fine thing. I've been keeping track of this, since, well, I'm 60, so since 12 years old, mm -hmm. and it works. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a hidden secret that people well, don't pay attention to. Well, it's something to pay attention to, to or think yeah. about. Like, if you have a day to choose to go hunting or not, and you have a falling barometer, man, you might want to take a, take a gamble on it and go, you know, instead of sitting it out, get in. Right, and that means the storm's coming or yeah. the front's coming in, the wind. But, yeah, I I still go out when it's 30, but it's more of a spot and stock then mm -hmm. instead of a calling sequence. And you see that with horses, too, like on a falling barometer when a store's rolling in. Like, the horses will be out active moving and bucking and kicking. Being kids. Even deer will be moving. They'll be feeding earlier yeah. and active. I mean, you see it with a lot of species and wildlife across, um, across the board. So I thought that was really interesting you had mentioned that. Um, and the other thing that you talked about, 
I thought was really interesting, and I have made this mistake a lot, is I'll run a digital call, and I want it to be loud so it really gets out there. You know, I feel like I need to, like, blow up a canyon to where a coyote can hear what I'm doing and know that I'm there. Like, I feel like it needs to be loud. And yesterday you were talking and you were saying, no, you know. Less is more. Less is more. Because the reason I figured this or figured it out, because I was the same way. Oh, man, I want to reach out there and touch those coyotes at 32 volume, the max. Mm-hmm. I come down back two clicks. I did. I ran a test on where I lived. The other one, there was a dog that always crosses the road at the end of the cul-de-sac, 925 years away. I put the e-collar out in the road. I turned it up to two. I can't even hear it standing yeah. 50 yards from it. That dog heard it 800 plus yards away. That's incredible. I mean, it just come and then... Then it come running down there, and I thought, and coyotes have exceptional hearing. They know their neighborhood. If something's foreign in there, they know it. And a lot of people, rabbits don't have enough air in their lungs to go at high volume like that in continuous run. Yeah. And it's, I just try to act like an animal, and it's, it works for me, and less is more. Mm-hmm. The only way I can hear it is I have headsets from Walker Game Ear, and I turn the volume up. I mean, you can hear mice walking. Mm-hmm. I mean, this amplification is so nice, but I can hear the call then if I'm using those. Yeah, that's interesting. I had my puppy out last week, and she heard like a mouse squeak, and I heard it too. And she took off and beelined for the sagebrush, and it was the coolest thing because she was acting just like a coyote. She heard that little, like a little tiny squeak, and she was gone, and I was like, Game on, little dog, go get that thing. (laughs) Kill it. (laughs) You know, but you're right. It doesn't take a lot and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be constant. And I mean, that's one of the things too, like when I'm calling elk and and you guys, you've helped been very instrumental in teaching me a lot of the stuff Lance is, um, it's like the theory of the least interested when you're dating. It's like you have a, a boy that a girl's calling him all the time. He can't stand it, you know, like gosh, this girl won't leave me alone. She calls me all the time. She's hanging on me all the time. But you have that girl that gives him just enough, calls him a little bit. Crumbs. crumbs. Yeah, crumbs. <laughs> and he just he just can't wait for his next little bite of that cookie, right? That so, is a great analogy. <clears throat> so, yeah, it is literally the theory of the least interested. So I, I really try to do that with my elk hunting, too, is like mm-hmm. if I call, 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 you know, those elk or a coyote or a turkey, whatever it is, they know exactly where you are to the tree stump you're sitting under, if you're sitting or whatever. But if you give them just enough and then if they kind of come in and they don't see anything, which often happens when you're calling, if you're constantly calling, they're going to hang up even harder than if you're a little more patient and make them go looking. Because mm-hmm. um, a lot of times they'll reveal themselves that you may not realize how close they are and, and, and stop giving them so much to go on. And what it is, it's not natural. Especially a cow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cows don't do that. No. You got to be the animal you're hunting and use their philosophy. And that's what I stand by is coyotes are the same way. Mm -hmm. They don't always howl. They come in silent, but not always howl and let, Mm -hmm. let them know you're there. So. So give everybody like a quick rundown from start to finish on your typical, like let's just talk about coyote hunting right now during breeding season. What, what do you guys do? What is, your, what is your opening sound to your closing sound? I still use e-collar late in the season, but every coyote has heard every sound from all summer all the way up to December. So, and everybody buys an e-collar, wants an e-collar that they can afford. They're all set sounds. Mm-hmm. So maybe Tom used it over here last week. Steve used it a month ago, same sounds. Mm -hmm. Animals get conditioned to response. Mm -hmm. They know a sound, just like an elk going to canyon one day and have good success, you know, didn't shoot anything. I'll change up my diaphragm or use a different tube if I go back in the canyon. I just don't want to give them the upper advantage of, oh, I heard that yesterday and it didn't smell good. I'm Mm -hmm. out of here, you know, type of thing. That's a great high level tip, changing your diaphragm Mm -hmm. and or your tube. Oh yeah. So I carry three or four diaphragms that Mm -hmm. I like and that's how I hunt every day. So a coyote's breeding season right now, I'll start out with just a howl. It's a non-threatening, hey, where's everybody out? Like a locate call. Location call, like for elk, I do it mm-hmm. safe. But what I use for coyotes is a siren and um, a, uh, or a high whistle, like a turkey shot gobble. Coyotes will answer that siren or train whistle and they're not threatening. If you howl at them, 
you better be in position because I've done it before. How oh, I got Kyle's answer and I'm going to go after him. As I was walking in, they're coming towards mm-hmm. me. And it's like we meet face to face and it's like game over. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so I'll howl and then I'll sit there for 10 minutes and just listen and listen and listen. Coyotes could be coming in. You don't know it. Mm-hmm. And then if I don't see anything, then I'll hit the e-collar for female breeding sounds. And I run it for maybe five, ten seconds and a low volume. It's one of those ones, coyotes out. Did I hear a female? Mm-hmm. Kind of like us at the bar yeah. when I was teenagers. You were know? last week for you. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. <laughs> you walked into that one later. Yeah. I did. <laughs> I did. did. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you, and curiosity. Did I hear it? I'm going to get closer to hear it. Yeah. Um, curious, mm-hmm. you know, and that's how we do it if you do it all the time it's like when you come home to your loved one would you rather hear hey baby how are you doing how was your day or where in the hell you been yeah hey i'm taking the first one yeah yeah so the volume and then and i know so much of what we do with calling is emotion based so how we make a sound you know we have so many different sounds we have cow sounds um calf sounds, estrus whines, mews, chirps, all of these sounds have a different inflection. And one thing that Rocky always taught me was that, you know, each one tells an emotion, tells a story and, you know, varying your sounds or having the ability to vary a sound, whether from turkey hunting or elk hunting or coyote hunting, having a good vocabulary, if you will, is is gonna help us be more successful in a call set. Yeah, and great point right there, match the emotion, right? Mm -hmm. You always talked about about matching the emotion. You know, you can tell if that bull is all fired up and ready to go or if he wants to slow play or if he's just maybe lazy bugling in his bed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matching that emotion is key. Mm -hmm. Well, last year I called in a bull for Yogi, and he had pulled a cow. And I never did bugle. I, 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 the bull was going over the canyon away from us, and there was another satellite bull that Yogi, I had actually called in for Yogi, and he missed. And, um, but I heard this other bull, so I just kept doing my thing. And I never expected this other bull to come in because he was moving away. And as you guys know, when you're calling to an elk's back, it hardly ever works out in your favor. And, but I kept it, I tried to keep my calling to where I had, like where I was making my sounds to where the one bull coming in, and I wasn't sure at that time he had missed it, but the one bull that I had coming in could come in on a line and give him a shot. Or the other bull, I was trying not to get too high that it would go past him, right? Well, I'll tell you, that bull had peeled off a cow, and she was so harassed by that bull, she wanted nothing to do with him. And Yogi had missed the one satellite bull I pulled in, and then this bull came in following his cow that was coming to my cow calls. Mm -hmm. Because she Mm -hmm. was just trying to get a break from this guy that was chasing her around. And so a lot of times what we're doing when we're elk hunting or whatever is we're not even calling the bull, we're calling the cows he's with. And if they're fed up with a bull and they hear some cows, if there's one or two of them and this guy's running them ragged, they're gonna wanna join some other ladies and get a break. Girl power. Which is why these cows, you know, they group up so they're not harassed so hard by these bulls. It gives that dominant bull an opportunity to check 15 cows or 10 cows and they get a little bit of a break. Mm In the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the U.S. and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite-specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. Can't yeah. talk about. Oh, I was just gonna. I was zoning out for a second, thinking about <laughs> Christy. When you're calling in the cows as opposed to the bulls, you're doing something right. Mm-hmm. I've always believed that. When you're calling the cows and getting the cows to come in as opposed to the bulls, you're making the right sounds. The emotion is there. The timing is there. Um, and just like you said, those bulls, those big bulls, they'll answer you every time your cow calling back and forth as that cow's coming in. But you're really calling in that cow. Yeah. And if you get her tricked. Mm, it could be very, very good as long as you don't come running in on yeah. your first and bust you. But. Well, and a lot of people hold still and they don't want to move. Yeah. If I don't have line of sight where the elk are and, and my the person I have set up to shoot is not in my line of sight, I mean, you're, you're, you're reading a situation completely on your sound, what you can hear. And I'm not afraid to walk around no. um, and move and make noise and rake a tree. Or, elk you are know, noisy. Elk yep. are noisy yeah. and, and they the don't caller, hold still. you yeah. got to work. Yeah. Two times harder as the hunter. That's right. Hunter has to stay there. I've yeah. had friends that say, 
stay right here. I'll call the bull to you. I think, God, he should be shooting. Mm -hmm. No, he decided to move 20 I, yards. Yeah. I did not see him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I pulled the bull in where he was. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's frustrating at mm -hmm. times. Well, and, and Christy, we talked about high-level tips and tactics. So, yes, a lot of times as you get more advanced in, in experience in your elk hunting career, let's call it shooter and caller, the shooter can move around as the caller is moving as well, depending on the wind mm -hmm. or what that bull's doing, right? You, you start to get high level, that shooter out front, yeah, he can make the move as to figure out whatever. Or but the caller needs to know where you're going. Yep. The caller needs to know where you're going a lot of time. And that can get into the, the part about talking, uh, having a great hunting partner That's or somebody mm -hmm. you've hunted with a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you if you're with somebody you are familiar with, you know each other, what you're yep. doing time and time, that's that's probably the best case scenario because you already know what that person's move that they're doing while you're calling. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. those things are hard to find, but when they when that works, it's amazing. I mean, that's yeah. that's as good as it gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's um let's talk a little bit too about um so let me finish out the predator thing because I keep getting really distracted. So what you're saying is, you know, your howl sounds, be patient. Um quieter barometric pressure falling mm -hmm. um and then you were another interesting predator tip you gave lance was closing out your sounds with some puppy sounds right coyotes when the species start breeding the <coughs> maternal instincts kick in it could be a think another coyote as ha a pup is loose mm -hmm. they're coming to either you know find it <coughs> or kill it coyotes have neighborhoods just like you have your own house you have mm -hmm. your own house and it could be a two mile square, it could be a three mile square. Roads are the barrier, so this is a family of coyote here. This is a pair over here. That's the reason you use howl and challenge sounds. Those coyotes think, well, he's in my home. I'm mm -hmm. gonna go investigate. Mm -hmm. So you could it's be- like a territorial. Yeah, look for droppings, cat, uh, coyote poop, I call it. And um, it's usually in a straight line down the road. It could be another coyote on this side, you know, family saying, so yeah just kayak pup distress and everything you have nothing else to lose mm -hmm. Might run and i run that extended mm -hmm. pup and i get it for about 12 minutes 15 nothing come in i'm out of here go to the next stand but keeping it simple the most important thing is wind patience <coughs> patience. patience it's just like elk hunting i mean you sit on a wallow thinking okay should i just start calling no wait till the evening time when they're up and moving unless yeah. you hear a bull pop off then physically Working. force your yourself yeah. to not make that sound till a certain time exactly and it's not easy it's mm -hmm. hard but it's definitely not easy i mean you always want to be active and calling but a lot of times it's anything i mean it's if the timing's right and you sit quiet how many times you've been sitting there and all of a sudden the bull walks in mm -hmm. and you look up and they're standing at 10 yards yeah you know you're talking about a, a huge animal that can come in completely silent yeah. <laughs> so sometimes our best our best thing is just to keep quiet and just sit and listen mm -hmm. and wait for a branch to break or or get ready because they'll come in and you're very quiet don't even call just rake yeah mm -hmm. I, i've used just raking and sit and wait especially if you're on the edge of a bedding area exactly you know we we hunted the edge of a bedding area quite a bit this year and we would <clears throat> we would go in you know real early at four o'clock kind of sit the edge where they were crossing this saddle and and um coming out of bed to feed and we just hang out there we wouldn't make any sounds. We just wait for them, and when we heard them start moving, then we know, okay, game on. You know, we're going to start moving, and and or you know, we drop down in the timber and do some raking. Or once once they were moving, once we saw activity, or we were watching and glassing elk. Okay, what time are these elk moving every day? Are they moving at 4:30? Are they moving at 5:30? And if if it's 6:30 and they've been moving at 5:30, they're moving somewhere. Maybe you're not in the right spot. Um, yep. You know, those those cues, you know, that'll kind of help you figure out if you're in the right place at the right time or not. Right, and that brings up for coyotes. Coyotes feed at night in the pastures where the mice and everything is. Coyotes are just like elk or deer. Once that sarn comes up, they take their time getting out of the field, and they head back up on the bluffs to bed for the day. Mm -hmm. So coyotes are just like big game animals. Mm -hmm. All right, so that those are some great coyote hunting tips, and I, hopefully everybody can kind of put some of those to use. And um, let's roll into talking a little bit about turkey because, you know, turkey season is going to be coming up next. It's already started down south. Yeah. Yeah, really some places mm -hmm. it's yeah. open. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's another one. It's such a blast. It, the part of the calling aspect of it is probably one of my favorite things there is because you're actually communicating on a different level. Um, I remember early on when I was turkey hunting, I just constantly would call. 
You mm-hmm. get a bird coming in. This is where that silent part really comes into play because they're no different than elk that they can pinpoint right where you're at. So if you give them where they have to come and look for you, mm-hmm. that's key. If you can get them coming and you can see them coming, just sit quiet. That's another time to just maybe give off a soft putt once in a while to, to zone them back in. But um, I used to make the mistake all the time of overcalling as they're mm-hmm. coming in. And then pretty soon they get just annoyed with you basically and off they go. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's so much fun to get that answer. Um, that yeah. first one in the spring, it's just like elk season in the fall. You get the first one, it's, it hooks you right back. So I do a lot of bow hunting for turkeys. And one of the things, <clears throat> obviously I'm sitting in a blind. And I used to hear a gobble on a ridge or a gobble up a valley. And I, I made the mistake a lot where I wanted to face the opening of my blind to where that turkey's coming from. And I've learned over the years, I'm better off actually taking my blind and turning it the back of my blind to where the turkey's coming from, where I can't see the bird come in. Because what'll happen if you have those windows open and the turkey, you're watching the turkey come in. Well, the turkey's watching you as he comes mm-hmm. in. And you move around in that blind, they're gonna see you and your chances of success on that bird are extremely um, reduced, in my opinion. And, and this is just something that's worked good for me is I'll set up that blind <clears throat> with the back of it facing where the turkey's coming from, I put my decoys out in front of me where I want the turkey to go. And that way, when the turkey comes around me, he's already in bow range by the time I see him. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you just sit there kind of ready. You can hear him come in if they gobble in. And you can't see him come in, but also they're they're not going to see you move. There you go. And that's mm-hmm. really helped me um, be a lot more successful turkey hunting. Um, you, I mean, if you're watching a turkey come in, he's watching you as he comes in. And, and I've had it... I've had it blow me, uh, blow so many sets, setting up just that one little thing wrong. I mean, where it's just really diminished my success on turkeys with a bow. No, that's a great point too, is because a turkey, unlike an elk, if you get seen or spotted by a turkey on the draw, You're your done. chances of stopping him are about zero. Yep. <laughs> you know, whereas, you know, we, we talk about how important it is hands-free and learning the diaphragm, not only with turkeys, but elk. Elk, a totally different deal. You, you know, you get busted on the draw with an elk, there's a good chance you'd get a little, yeah cow calling and Mm -hmm. stop that bull so yeah my goal is when by the time the turkey comes in i can see him he's already looking at my decoy Mm -hmm. at that point he's not even he's not paying attention to my blind i can draw my bow and and get my shot executed um without having that turkey see me because they're at that point they're looking at the decoy and they're ready to either fight or they're strutting or they're doing whatever you know they're doing Mm -hmm. um and and i love turkey hunting last year was such an interesting year we hunted i killed my turkey like the last week of may and it was really hard because the turkeys, the toms were gobbling, but they were not coming into my calls at that mm-hmm. point. And so I was really working off a pattern is where are they going during the day? And I either wanted to catch them coming out of their roost tree or going back to it. You know, kind of that, um, <clears throat> what I would call a, I don't know, a migration time frame or whatever. And, and um, I had some hens that were down below me and the tom was above me. And I just plunked myself in between the hens and the tom never made a sound and let him move by me and got my shot just nice. based on pattern because that tom i had been hunting him for days and he just wasn't he, i mean he'd gobble his head off but end of may mm-hmm. you know and this goes into all these different strategies and techniques that we you know kind of develop over time with hunting experience and and it is constantly a, a learning evolution i mean we all want to be able to just jump on our call and have turkeys come in or elk come in and have it just be super, you know, instant. But that's just not the reality of any hunting. No, no. Kent and I last year had an opportunity to go to South Dakota on a really, really fun turkey hunt. And it was the first time I had really hunted turkeys using a fan. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, a poem where it's, it's thicker and trees, you know, you count them on the edge of fields and all that kind of stuff. Same deal as with you. You're in a blind and you're calling. Sometimes you'll get them to come in, sometimes not. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a turkey expert by no means i can get them to make noises i can i know where they're at i can spot and stalk them but going to south dakota and using those fans that was a different experience have Mm -hmm. you ever done that oh yeah yeah tons of one thing with fanning is it doesn't really work very well in the timber right it's a lot harder in the timber Mm -hmm. it's just it's just like they've got a strut zone and in the timber that fan that fan you can just give it to them give them a flash of it in the timber and then tuck it away and hide it and it just gives them enough to where you don't look like a full strutting bird but it makes them come in Mm -hmm. well they're another high level tip of just the flash Mm -hmm. when else would we use a flash decoy elk hunting Mm -hmm. same deal you know that bull coming down that ridge he just needs to see a glimpse of that brown you've Mm -hmm. tricked his ears 
you know, you've tricked his nose, you give him that flash, you trick the eyes, you're in business. Yeah. yeah. So and you guys they, using a Montana decoy for that too? All so they care about the is the back or end. the Miss September yep. or which yep. one? Yep. That's, that's my go-to is a Miss September. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in New Mexico, I've hunted New Mexico before, and, and that's such wide open desert country. Those guys will sit behind a Miss September and call and, and call in bulls, um, mm-hmm. and they won't even go out without one because it's so open. I mean, there's no sense in calling. Sure. Yep. See, you know. Yep. Christy, uh, speaking of decoys, elk hunting, we use, they got cattle in the area, use that bovine decoy in mm-hmm. elk hunting too, because elk are you seeing cows. If you got to get for the Miss Grover trees of this to get closer, we just use the cow decoy. They can't count legs. Elk don't count. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you walk to the next of the trees and then put the bovine up. Use that as part of your. Mm-hmm. Seems like it works yeah. good that way. Yeah. So anything else you guys want to talk about turkey hunting? I mean, we've got the strutter box. I personally. I'm not a good turkey caller. I'm not good at making good turkey diaphragm sounds. Our yes, diaphragms for, well, you, our you diaphragms are. for turkeys, the palate's a little bit wider on mm-hmm, those diaphragms. Mm-hmm. So I have a more challenging time blowing those calls. And they're designed for turkeys. And, and I just have a harder time with those calls. The strutter box, though, <clears throat> of all of our calls, that thing just, the turkeys can't help it. Yep. They answer it. Well, a nice thing with a box call, It a lot of times I'll start with a box call. Mm-hmm. Um, try and get them ranged, figure out where they're at, and then I do a lot of cutting on a box too. Um, I get birds like they're excited, there's something going on, they got to come over and check it out. So I've had a lot of good luck doing that. And then maybe finish them with a slate or a diaphragm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously coming in hands free with a diaphragm is mm-hmm. you kind of have to be that way. Um, so you're starting out with some volume and then kind of quieting it down a little bit as that tom approaches. Yep, and there's times I'll come in and call quiet just in case there's a bird in the area that's mm-hmm. close. Good you know? point there. And mm-hmm. you don't want to come in, and elk are the way too, you don't want to come in and blow them out right away. You want to yeah. give them a little soft, make sure if there's anything close. Coyotes, you were talking about that too. Um, and then hit the long range. So a box call, a nice thing too, is it can cut the wind a little bit. Yeah. It, it gets them to answer. Real quick on a diaphragm, Chris, you talked about the, a turkey diaphragm completely different than it your is. your elk diaphragm. Well, we do have the captain hook in our line, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is on our popular GTP frame, mm-hmm. which is basically an elk diaphragm that's a turkey call. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that one works really well for guys and gals that have just elk hunted for like yeah. crazy. And then they put that diaphragm in. It's it's made for turkeys. It's got the turkey cut. And so it, it does good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and sound, you know, learning how to make your putts and all of that stuff. I mean, there is a is a true art to doing all of that and when and how. I'm not an expert at it. And I mean, I've produced a lot of turkey hunting shows and um, I have guys make fun of my turkey calling all the time uh, because I, I'm not ever gonna like proclaim that I'm some genius at turkey calling. But at the end of the day, every year I kill a turkey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, yep. okay, well, Roof is in the uh, yeah. you know, I might not be the best. I might not be a competitive turkey caller, but at the end of the hunt, I, I've yet to go, you know, a season without notching a turkey tag. Yeah. So it's working. Two you know, different and, worlds. And you don't have to be perfect to do this stuff. Elk calling, oh, turkey calling, predator calling. Like, you do not have to be an expert. And I think there's such an intimidation factor for people, especially women um, or new callers or hunters that are like, man, I'm not very good. And, and they're afraid to go out there and try. And I talked to a, a junior caller yesterday, and she's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm just not that good at it. And I'm like, well, go out there and let the elk tell you how bad you there are. You go. Yep. I said, because I've seen so many elk answer bugles or cow calls and they don't sound great but they still work so let your success be rated on your you know that you know the success of your hunt or the outcome of your hunt or the outcome of your potential opportunities not saying you're not going to make mistakes go make them and have a good time and make the calls make the sounds and be confident yeah believe in yourself if you're timid the animals are going to hear that timidation too just be confident call like you stole it Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, Perfect and yeah, everybody stuff. starts somewhere, yeah. you know. Yeah. Everybody starts, everybody's new at some point. And so you're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn. That's the only way. Those are uh, learning lessons. The, the best education is in yeah. the field, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, chasing animals, the best way is just make those mistakes, learn from it, and it just gets better year after year. And then mm-hmm. once that confidence gets built up, you'll see a huge change. Confidence can be a big game changer for we you. We talk about experience is gold, right? Yep. It absolutely is, it is gold. you got to get out there and do it. If we... Uh, move from turkey just to elk real quick we talk sequences right um rocky i'm sure he's talking and you know we've worked rocky for many many years starting out a sequence wherever you're at cow call Mm -hmm. soft and a soft cow call right away because 
that bull could if be he's close. 50 yards. Yep. Yeah, and I remember I was sitting down and, and coming and screaming in his bedroom. Yep, yep. <laughs> and if you go in there and you blow out even just a locator bugle, he might, no, nah, see you later. But you start with that soft cow call and then move into, you know, depending on what time of the season it is, is more nasal estrus mm -hmm. cow calls into your locator bugle, into your display. And if you're lucky enough to have one that fired up, and then you can get into your challenge bugle. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the progression, right? So what yeah. do you think? Just I just use three basic calls for elk. I've never lip buzzed an elk in. I've never. Mm -hmm. It's location, cow call, and challenge. Those are about the three. The, the basic sounds, and you're efficient at those, and then timing, yeah, you're going to. Mm -hmm. Right. Most people, well, I want a lip ball and everything. That's novelty. That's for contest and show. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds great, mm -hmm. but in the woods, you don't need it. Keep it simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and last year, you know, I called in a lot of elk last season. I had one of my best seasons calling in elk, and I didn't even touch a bugle. I, I, I cow called everything mm -hmm. in. Wow. Yeah. Everything I cow called in. And, and it was just, <clears throat> I had so many guys say, well, the, the elk out here, you know, they don't like a bugle, da 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 da, right. da. And the thing was, is, you know, the bull to cow ratio, what I was seeing personally is there'd be a herd bull with his cows and I'd see four or five satellite bulls and I would have shot any of the satellite bulls. Mm -hmm. and well, why do I need to bugle right now? I can, if I just let this bull think that there's some cows yep. that have strayed a little too far and he's got a chance. Mm -hmm. And it worked really well for me last year. Now I'm not saying that's going to work every time. Right. But um, it certainly doesn't hurt. You know, general rule, you, you get a bull answer on a cow call, you can stick on a cow call, get him on a bugle, stick on a bugle. Mm -hmm. You get more advanced and, and learn the basics and become efficient, then you mix in both. You know, mm -hmm. and, and the bulls are smart. The, the yeah. younger bulls, you might be able to get the younger, more immature bulls on the one sound, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as they get older wiser. and more mature <laughs> and wiser, yeah, you got to start. They didn't get big for being dumb. No. Yep. Nope. That's when you're really going to find out how good you are. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you think you got it figured out, they humble you real quick. That's a great point. Yeah. That is a great point. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. One thing that I always try to keep in mind is if whatever you're doing is working, don't change it. Mm -hmm. um, if you do a series of cow calls and you're mixing, you know, your cow calf sounds and some estra sounds and you have a bull responding and it sounds like he's coming in, just stick to that. Mm -hmm. Don't change it because once you throw in a bugle, now it's went from a date to a fight potentially and um, or, or c vice versa. If a bugle's working. Don't, you know, just stick with it. Just stick with what you're doing. What you're doing. Be patient and listen a lot. I mean, these elk, um, if they're bugling, they may be walking. But a lot of times, I find that a bull will bugle and then he moves. And yep. so, if you're not hearing a lot from them, a lot of times it's because they're looking and listening, and that can mean they're either walking towards you or they're standing back and looking and listening. So and sometimes, if you give them too much, you're gonna, you're gonna, they're, they're gonna be like, oh, I'm looking, listening. And I'm not looking, I'm not seeing what I need to see. And, and so being a little bit more on that passive side sometimes is really good. And just let them look and listen and get curious. And that's a good point is <clears throat> Rocky, the master of this, it taught me. I thought I knew everything, but Rocky is just father wisdom. When you call from a certain area, before you call, if the wind's going left to right or right to left or whatever the wind's doing, find a spot 10 yards, 20 yards away. So when you make that call, you half moon it to that place because mm -hmm. those elk will come right to where you're calling within mm -hmm. a foot mm -hmm. and 
they don't know you're over there. They think something's over here and mm-hmm. you get your broadside shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They always circle to the downwind. Yep. Always. Um, and, and that's just, you can bet on it every time you always want to set up when you're working in a shooter collar pair, you want that uh, shooter set to that downwind side of the collar because the, these bulls will almost always circle. They're not dumb. Um, and, and I say that I've had a very rare instance once or twice in my calling life where a bull will beeline in, but most of the time they circle downwind. Just like coyotes and wolves. Yep. 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 Matching uh, the emotion we talk about when we're calling, when we're calling bulls. Let's talk a little bit about, I've had a lot of success of just trying to mimic that bull bugling. Mm -hmm. Uh, For whatever reason, you know, whether it's a groaner bull or it's a long locator call with a little bit of grunt at the end, no grunt, you match it, he's like, Hey, that that's me. Uh, now I'm real interested. I know you are. What I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. that's right. You know, and, and that's the that's the best education to, to tune the ear. That's a great point. Is in yeah. the woods, right? It's actually hearing an elk. Yeah. So, a lot of a lot of fun when you're able to do that. Yep. Well, and it's crazy because I we you know we packed in this year. And we, we went into a brand new spot. You know, we just moved to Wyoming. We don't know anything about where we're hunting. We, this is our first bow season. And we camped in a good spot, and <laughs> the day before season, there was elk 50 yards above our camp. <laughs> like, we have mules on a, really we <laughs> have mules on a picket line, and we're literally sitting in camp the day before season watching elk, and we're like, oh, man. And, and I was really terrified. I'm like, man, we are in the danger zone here. Like, this is too close. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to be a little removed from this, but to you're be gonna, honest you're with gonna you. are going to change their pattern. Well, it didn't, it, we, it didn't, though. Oh, that's it was awesome. really interesting because we kept, you know, we kept the mules in the timber and our camp was in the timber and our down, our, our, the wind for the most part, when the elk were feeding and stuff, the wind was going down. And so we were staying out of their wind while they mm-hmm. were out feeding. And so it really didn't bother them. Um, not the degree that I thought. Um, and, and in certain wilderness, not wilderness, but forest areas, it's not that easy to just pick up and move your camp because especially when you have livestock, you have to have certain resources, you know, yeah. feed water, and then you want them to be, you know, in shade during the day in those hot, hot times. And um, I was really surprised. But, you know, you guys, when you get out there and you are in a new area, um, I mean, that's why we all go back to the same places we go over and over or we want to scout. Um, and the thing is, is you never know how the elk are going to change from, you know, that early season when they're kind of just breaking out of bachelor herds, starting to look for cows a little bit, starting to gather up to... There's elk frigging going everywhere because there's a hunter two draws away pushing a herd over here. Sometimes it doesn't really matter where you camp. If there's a bunch of hunting pressure, people might be pushing stuff through that don't even know you're there. And, and you you kind of got to not really overthink things sometimes and, and go to the best place you can that offers you good concealment, keeps you out of the way, mm-hmm. um, keeps you out of their, their migratory route. But um, I, I was really surprised this year. And, and honestly, I felt like the mules almost almost disguised the scent yeah. like I mean, we had a bull literally walk through our camp one night bugling <laughs> and i have a picket line full of mules and they just d- didn't care how many times have you heard the story <clears throat> with mules and horses out in the back country or even rural areas where there's elk and they're making their noises and here comes a big bull in mm-hmm. because he is so fired up yeah. you know and i think it has a lot to do with riding the mules and the horses too and the walking i mean they're mm-hmm. hearing similar stuff so there's a lot to be said have you done a podcast on just getting into the whole mule thing and all that yet? Because I think that'd be super interesting because no. it is work. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah. I know that. I get, I, yeah, I mean, I'm running a lot of mules and, and ultimately, you know, um, some of the trips my dad's on, some of them he's not. Mm-hmm. When my dad's there, it's really nice because he's sure. a heck of a hand, but yep. I'm getting off track. But it, they are a lot of work and, and I have a lot of people come talk to me about them and, okay. and they're a blessing yeah. out there. I promise you that. But they're also a huge responsibility. Yep. You know, and and it is great. You know, we we packed in this last year, 15 miles, and um, you know we had one two nights where you know my dad had shot a really nice old bull, mm-hmm. and uh, my cameraman and I we I was age hunting, and I thought you know we, I don't even I couldn't even tell you how many bulls I passed this season. It was an awesome season, wow. just young young bulls, yeah. and we literally would just walk in these ridges. Nope, nope, nope. Too young, too young, too young. And I I hunted for age this year, and and also size. So when we got a good size bull that had age, I, my dad 
my my, mm -hmm. my dad um, took it, and I said, no, I'm I'm going to shoot age and I want size. I was trying to go in for that double trifecta, mm -hmm. but we went way in deep, and um, and you know we, we it, it it was an awesome season, and, and it just fires me up to go back you yeah. know this year again too, and and it's it's fun when you have that progression. You know, the last day of season, Yogi and I were in there, and and I passed on a a young five by five with my bow. And we had a heck of a time, just good time calling them, calling them in. And at the end of the, you know, I just kind of sat there and I looked at the camera and I said, you know, this is a cool setup. If I were in Oregon, I'd totally shoot this bull, but I can go now gun hunt and I can spend my yeah. season hunting elk. And at the end of the day, I love hunting elk. And that was my choice. And, and, uh, and it, it's just fun to be out there, you know, yep. and have those opportunities. You well, know? And you stuck to your guns. We talk about seasons. You had to best season ever for yeah. not killing a bull. Lance, Lance had a stellar season. Rocky Mountain hunting calls in general had a stellar had a season. season. Lance was done in about two minutes. Two I, bulls in like two days. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. was. And mm. how we did it, we went to an area, Jake, my hunting partner at the time, he said, what do you want to hunt? What are we going to do? I said, I don't know. Let's just close our eyes and point at a map in Idaho and we're going to hunt that and practice what we preach, scouting. Mm -hmm. Well, we, okay, we're there. We bought those tags for it. And how are we going to do this? And Jake asked me that. And I said, well, let's drive up this road. It's one way in, one way out. Let's find the closest hunters. And it gets busier and busier. Let's back up to the next camping spot. Camp there. Jake, you go up this ridge. I'll go up this ridge. This is the day before hunting season. If you find fresh sign, turn around, come back out. Mm -hmm. I did the same. Found fresh sign come back out we didn't want to saturate our smell mm -hmm. opening morning we walked up in there and called and bull came in jake shot it and then we finished cleaning his up there's another one with that ball i was going to try to get him but it didn't work out next morning we went back here and called in that same bull that i didn't take a shot at came running into a cow call and shot it and we we're done yeah i know i hadn't even gotten started and i'm getting yeah. The pitchers and lancers on the board. It's like that was a great start to the season. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Then the work begins. Then yeah. the work begins. Uh, we spent a lot of time, myself in particular, and these guys on the road last year, archery season. I was on six archery elk hunts in six weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, so I got to catch everything from the pre-rut to the, the heart of the rut to the post-rut, mm -hmm. you know, from Montana to, to Wyoming to, to Idaho. And so. So break it down. One of the things I saw this year, and what I would consider peak rut, mid to end of September. Mm -hmm. I saw the biggest bull of my season by himself, not bugling and not not responsive to calls. What I was floored by it. Like, what the heck? I think things are changing. Yeah. Our sure. axis of our world. Yeah. So things, the temperatures are so hot nowadays in September. Yeah. When I mess, it was cold. You actually had to bundle up and stay dressed all day long. It's just... It's different now. Mm -hmm. And he could have been at that point where he was done. Yeah. You know. Oh, it was just so disappointing. I mean, I'm walking back to camp and I walk right into him. He's not, he's by himself feeding, well, not he probably nothing. just got tired just, of listening to the women. <laughs> his peak rut. Like, what's going on, dude? <laughs> That's Lance projecting onto Elk his own lifestyle here is what's going on. I, my bad. That's exactly. Sorry. But, it, you know, you just don't know. And, and that's the thing. When we get out there. You know, early season, you know, Rocky always had some really great early season strategies of doing, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of cow-calf sounds. So, you know, Rocky young herd, yeah. um, raking a tree, and then you know, like young bugle sounds, yep. you know, mm -hmm. uh, not real aggressive, just super, like almost like we would call like a spike type bugle, mm -hmm. and, and just sitting and hanging out and, know, and doing those Well, that brings up a good games. point. You see a big herd of cows and you see a bull, you think that's a herd bull. Mm -hmm. No, these big old bulls are laying out somewhere. They let all the young teenagers do all the work, yeah. and then it's like, okay, it's time. Kick the young pup out, and yeah. they take over the girls. Yeah. yeah. You made a great point earlier of knowing when to be quiet, right? Yeah. On the turkey thing, applies to elk like crazy. Idaho this year, perfect example. It was awesome. A lot of people in that unit, but there were a lot of elk in there. Um, and right away, you, you get the elk coming in. I mean, you get them 40, 50 yards and hang in, have them hang up, and you know as well as anybody hunting with a cameraman, it's much more difficult mm -hmm. than when you don't. So a couple of the setups didn't work out, but when it did work out, a bull came in. I mean, it's back and forth, and he's fired up, and I'm quiet. Here he comes. He hangs up at 60. 
he just something wasn't right turns around takes his cows goes to the next ridge well i'm not hiking down and back over after mm-hmm. i went up the face of this mountain so slow played him he bugled no bugle no bugle again you give him a little bugle late you know i'm sitting there time to eat a sandwich you do that for about 20 25 minutes all of a sudden i see him in the timber start slowly walking back and just slow played him and and worked him right back in he'd put his cows to bed and come over but it was because he knew when to be quiet right if i keep calling keep calling he's locating me just like i'm locating Mm -hmm. him finally he's like you know that's kind of some elky behavior maybe i'm gonna go over there and check it out so great point and nice bull hey we gotta eat (laughs) yeah Yeah. no it's all it is so rewarding when it comes together Mm -hmm. and i think um you know, for me, I, I get a, as much of a thrill, if not more, out of calling in elk for people than actually being the, I mean, my 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 struggle with my hunting team is my husband doesn't call and my dad can't hear. Um, so it's really hard. <laughs> it's I saw really your hard. dad, by the so way, yesterday. I do. Yeah. I, I, archery season, it, it's easy for me to say, okay, well, let me give you guys the opportunity. And that's, you know, that's how we unfolded it this year. And I kind of take the backseat a little bit, but... Um, because I know I get to gun hunt, you know, and, mm-hmm. and there's so much reward to that. And then, you know, some of these elk, you know, they'll keep you up all night long. And then during the day, it's like they don't even exist, you know. I, I mean, it's just the most frustrating, aggravating thing. Um, and it's just getting out there and spending time in the woods and learning, okay, early season, these are some strategies that other people have done that have worked for them. And then, you know, peak rut, here's some strategies. And, you know, are you trying to hunt that herd bull or are you happy with trying to call in a satellite bull? Sure. And, and and you can kind of strategize your hunt and make your sounds based on, you know, what, what your objective is. If you're only focused on that herd bull, you got eyes on them and you got it out for that one. A lot of that's going to be stealth. Yep. Um, and, and not making a lot of sound and really trying to get close and penetrate that herd and get to a position where that bull can't ignore you. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people want to call, call, call. Well, when you're too far away from that bull and he's comfortable with you calling, he, he's just ignoring you. I mean, you're just giving away your location. You're losing the art of surprise. And uh, I, if I'm trying to target a big bull, I really try to be as quiet as I can sure. and keep the wind good. Um, and then I'll back out of a spot if you know we had some elk this last year that were bedding in a spot and I they were bedding there every night I didn't dare go on that face of the mountain when the wind was wrong I'm like no they're in there I'm not blowing them out let them lay you know you can kind of rate hunting pressure but then somebody always can sneak in on you too but I always try to play it safe. Even if I'm on public, I would I try to hunt it as if I were on private and try to give the elk that same respect and space uh, to bed and do things and, and try to keep the same mindset with, with their need for rest and my need to keep the wind right and, and not to bump them. Because once you bump them, they're done. They go. Mm-hmm. And elk go far, as yep. we all know. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Several years ago, we did a podcast. Chris, I don't know if you remember because you do have a lot of podcasts, but in uh, Park City, you asked a question. You said, hey, Josh, bulls bugling down in the bottom. How are you going after them? And a lot of variables come into play. Yeah. What time of the season, all that kind of good stuff. Well, being a guy like these guys and yourself that likes to call, well, I'm going to try and get close to his level, and I'm going to call him in and get an arrow in him. And Christy, she's like, well, if he just keeps bugling, why don't you just get down there, slip in on him, and kill him? And I'm like, you win. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, I, I'm like, duh. <laughs> Because I want to call him in. I was like, well, smarter, not harder. And I, that, that was a great point. Now, mm-hmm. now I was see, I'm a seasoned elk hunter at that time. I've got a lot of experience in here. I'm like, that's a, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. She <laughs> is right. Yeah. If they're screaming their head off, why do I need to get them to talk? Right. There there you go. Go. They're doing the job. You. I don't yeah. need to do anything. And yeah. that's what we tell people at our booth that come in and ask for tips. You know, how, hey, if they're calling, yeah. don't call. Yeah. Get in close, then yeah. use your cow if you seduction. Need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. These we had one last year in our camp that frick he'd just scream all night long and scream and scream and he'd shut up and then just nothing 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 and we were like okay well let's go i couldn't get him to answer a call and and i'd give up on him and we'd run we'd climb at 800 vertical and go clear to the top of this other zone and then all of a sudden there he is and i'm mm-hmm. like you joker like <laughs> like ah it was I, and i never did get eyes on that well actually I, I, he winded us. I did call him in one day and uh, about to 150 yards, and he got my wind and got my wind before I realized he did. But um, they are smart, especially when they're older. Um, those older bulls don't get big by being stupid. 
and um, and, mm -hmm. and they'll let you know they're around sometimes, but they don't always want to come in. And I, I think a lot of that is just is just their age, and they've been called to, and they've yep. been pushed on, and yep. and they're and, and the bulls. In my opinion, the bulls are bugling more to attract cows than they are to talk to other elk. You know, a dominant bull is bugling to let the cows know where they are because the cows will go to the bull. They pick their mate. They yep. pick their mate. The cows pick the bull. And in, when you hear two bulls bugling across a canyon, there's a lot of trains of thought on that. And, and I think a lot of it is when one bull bugles over here, he's letting the cows know where he's at. Well, then this bull is like, hey, wait a second, ladies. I'm yeah. also over here. So if you're closer to me, come over here. And I, and I honestly feel like these bulls are more competing to let the cows know where they are more than they care about where each other is. That's when you're going to hear all that bugling, too. The, the most fun is when you can get into multiple bulls mm -hmm. and there's a hot cow around. Yeah. Ooh. You can definitely tell when there's a hot cow because yeah. everything <laughs> is fired up. It's a buffet. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the bulls are running everywhere and they're screaming and they all want to be the one that gets the attention of those cows. Mm -hmm. Dumb boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's, I, everybody asks you know, what's your favorite animal to hunt? What's your favorite big game hunt? And I, I mean, if you're an elk hunter, I think anybody that's done elk hunting or, or knows how to run a call or has taken the time to learn how to run a call and has been in the woods during the rut, I don't think that there's a more intoxicating hunt or an exciting hunt than calling elk. Well, people ask me, what's it feel like? It's a drug that you cannot explain to people yeah. until they experience that yeah. emotional dump some get it beforehand buck fever after they shoot they start throwing up i have before mm -hmm. just so excited and then okay get my composure and i got nauseous and threw up it's just the excitement you mean like earlier is that what happened <laughs> that was not throw you up you were so excited you made me about laugh. doing the podcast that you're just like <laughs> spitting out your hero on the ground here right I'm not sure what was going on with that. But Thanks, Yogi, for that, I think that I th I'm pretty sure that's what happened. No, that was yeah. laughing. I couldn't hold it down. I couldn't swallow. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys, anything, you know, last minute, um, you know, one thing I want to just kind of wrapping up, let everybody listening, watching know, um, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls has so many different types of calls. So if you're predator hunting, you know, we've got diaphragm howling systems. You guys, you know, rely on those electronic systems. We've got predator sounds that, you know, these bullet casings to, you know, I, um, external, external, like they're like a blow call. I don't know mm -hmm. what the correct terminology is for them that make different types of sounds from cottontails, jackrabbits. There's a huge variety of predator sounds. Same on the turkey side. You know, we've got the we've got the box calls, we've got the slate calls, yep. we've got diaphragm calls. Um, we've got tons of options. So if you can't run a diaphragm, we have a call that will work for you on the elk side. You know, we've got the bugle tubes, we've got diaphragms, we've got external reed cow calls. You know, we've got something so that everybody has an opportunity to get out in the field totally and be successful. Yeah, she's as good as anybody. Yeah. White tail line as well. We've got oh, yeah. the white tail line. Yeah, white tail. Um, Christy can come to our booth and do it. So we kind of hang our hat too as in fitting people, right? Mm -hmm. We get that pallet plate fitted to that right diaphragm so you can flex the tongue mm -hmm. and seal and not lose any air mm -hmm. and have you call in just like that. And it's yeah. it's been a lot of fun. And you're an exceptional caller yourself. And, uh, you know, we all are under Rocky, you know, yeah. Jacobson. We're under Rocky, Rocky yeah. Street. We're we under really Rocky Street. And, and so, yeah. Uh, the GOAT. New products for this year, a couple new diaphragms. We got that new DD2, mm -hmm. our grunt tube, which is awesome. It's gonna, it has that snort wheeze on it. The new diaphragm pouch. Um, trying to accessorize the game bags. Check out the game bags. Mm -hmm. and we have had a ton of success with our game bags. They're, they're a hit, but uh, you're right. Yeah, we have everything that you need for your calls and accessories that, to, to be successful in the woods. And when it comes to a diaphragm, like we talk about fitting, you know, we've got the tone top, which is like that plastic yep. top diaphragm and then we've also got the traditional palette plate which is kind of based off of what Rocky originally started with like a spoon um, different widths on tapes different widths on those palette plates my wild theory is slightly more narrow I've got a pretty narrow mouth so that one's a little bit more narrow um, and so really before you just buy a call and be like well I can't do it or I tried this call it didn't work for me um, try several the latex stretch is different the latex thickness is different and just try which one you think sounds better feels better what functions best for you my favorite elk call might not be your favorite and mm -hmm. and that goes around the world um, so Chris, and, I've had yeah. people another state they call me hey what size of diaper well I don't know take your phone take a picture of your palette they've been sending it to me okay this is your palette this is your di diaphragm you need Mm -hmm. So, 
call our company. We yes. all know how to do it, and mm-hmm. we'll take a picture of your palate. And we'll tell you what call you need. Don't send me a picture of your mouth. Just send (laughs) send the mouth pictures to Lance. His Instagram (laughs) handle is one in rut, not me. Don't send me a photo of your mouth. I do not know how to do this. Uh, You're giving me credit where credit is not due, and I don't want photos of your mouth. Forward on. So send them to Lance. Uh, he's going to help you with that. Or just send him to Josh. Yep. Uh, yep. He'll we forward him to Lance. Yeah. Lance is going to be doing this either way. <laughs> yep. uh, but it is true. Everybody's different and everybody's going to have a, a favorite, you know, and mm-hmm. that's that's one of the beauties of of how many different types of diaphragms we manufacture yep. for, for different people and different reasons. Yep. Yep. And the nice thing about them is when you have three or four different diaphragms in your you know, in your arsenal with you in the field, if one sound isn't working, switch it up. Try a different call, try a different diaphragm, try a different type of bugle and, and um, see if you can get something to work. Yep. Um, one thing we do, Christy, if we go into a canyon, had great success calling mm-hmm. an elk, we didn't burger them. Hey, let's go back into the next day. We change up our diaphragms. Mm-hmm. We use a different diaphragm, a different tube. Animals are conditional response. Mm-hmm. So that's another tip we can do for them. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's a great tip. Well, I appreciate all of you guys for, you know, taking the time uh, pre-show here to sit down with me. I know you got a booth to get to. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, you guys, we have a tremendous dealer network out there. So please support yes. your local dealers. And if your local shop does not carry Rocky Mountain hunting calls, ask them to. It's a simple process for them to be able to come, you know, become a dealer. You can also shop online buglingbull.com and you can go online and shop our calls there if you have questions email or phone you know yep. and customer service is going to be there to help you and if they can't help you we're going to get you to lance where he's going to help you with, with <laughs> <laughs> well customer with whatever service you need lance is our new customer we service go above guru. and beyond yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway uh anything else you guys want to throw no, in no thanks so much for having us yeah, yeah. thank, yes, thank you very much it's so much fun to be able to get together and do this especially with great friends who've known yeah. each other a long time you truly are the best in the business. No, my gosh, no, we, we no, he's lying you. to me. No, we, <laughs> there's a reason yes. why you've been around. Well, not date you because we're not as older as some of us I'm here. I'm too old for Lance. We appreciate your uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate your time. I've seen Christy when we first got into this business. I was with her. <laughs> yeah. She's came a long ways and earned it. So yeah, yeah we've yep. had a good time. I, the first elk calling seminar I went to was Lance and Rocky. Yep. And I was in my twenties. That's all. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> really? That was a good time. Yeah, that was, and, and we've been friends ever since. So it's, it's been yeah. a long, great friendship, great relationship with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. I can't say enough good things about the products, about the team. And uh, we want you guys to be sending us your photos, too. So when mm-hmm. you are successful, whether it be coyotes, turkeys, um, white-tailed deer, or elk, Tag us in your photos. DM Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls your photos, and they're going to share those for you. Tag Absolutely. me in them. Share them with me. I'll repost your success. We want to celebrate your hunt success with you because we win as a team collective. Yep. Yep. So, and one uh, thing about our company is customer service. Yeah. We want to do quality instead of quantity. Yeah. Everybody wants quantity, but we're one-on-one with the per- mm-hmm. people. They don't leave the booth until they can make sounds, and we work with them with that. Yeah, if you guys are at any of these shows, don't be afraid to walk up to the booth and talk to our team. Um, they're going to help you, you know, pick out a call, fit a call, and start making those sounds and give you great advice to get you going in the right direction. Or if you're an experienced caller, to help you kind of fine tune where you're at in your calling journey as well. Yep. So, um, thank you all for tuning in for this episode of the Wild Nine Cut Podcast. Coming at you from Hunt Expo, we're at the Ruger Marlin booth. They're a great partner of ours. We want to thank our partners. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is one of them. SCI. Onyx, Wilderness Athlete, you guys, thank you for tuning in. Go to my website, PursueTheWild.com, uh, watch all the podcasts, watch all our episodes, and then also ch- click the discount tab. I've got tons of great discounts. I want you guys to get the best deals on my partner gear. Um, click that discount tab, and it'll take you shopping. So thank you all again. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher, making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition.
Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram. 